another American TESOL Present Free Friday Webinars. I'm your hostess, Shelly Sanchez Terrell, and today we're talking about teaching to multiple intelligences, and we're going to also talk about learning styles. This is brought to you by American TESOL and the ESLtech.com course, where you can take it at your own pace online and receive a certification in teaching with technology. Um, you can find the resources on the American TESOL, the recordings of the American TESOL YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash users slash ATESOL. And you can always bring a friend because we're here every Friday and it's free. So let's talk about learning styles and multiple intelligences. And it's important that we talk about both. The reason why I'm talking about both is because there's a very famous a man associated or theorist associated with multiple intelligences and his name is Howard Gardner. So I'm sure that you have heard of the famous theory that How Howard Gardner in 1983 came up with. He proposed that we all have different intelligences. In fact, he says that all of us, all of us today, have eight different intelligences. But the difference is, in all our students as well, no matter where you are in the world, that's what the learning theory says. But with multiple intelligences, what he talks about is that some of us are much stronger and have strengths in certain areas. Um, this is what it looks like today. He also talks about learning styles. And it's important to note that when he talked about multiple intelligences and learning styles, he didn't mean that they were the same. In fact, they are different. They are quite different. So many of you may have heard different theorists who do not believe in multiple intelligences. Um, there, there are many who disagree. But one of the great things about this theory and knowing um, about the learning styles and multiple intelligences is that we're able to really uh, come to realize that each of us has unique ways that we learn, okay? And that's very important for the classroom. So we're going to talk about how we can take that out of this theory, how we can identify what the learning strengths are with our students, how they can discover some things about the way they learn and how that can help them and how that can help you. And especially with language learners, I think this, oh, this theory is really great because what it helps teachers do is it helps them differentiate their instruction. So instead of just lecturing, there are some great things here that we can do in our classes that help all our language learners. For example, body kinesthetic, bodily kinesthetic. Can we think of a way to incorporate that in our classes? Well, TPR, total physical response, having hands-on learning, visual spatial. So we know that with language learners, it is really important that we have visuals in the classroom, that when we're talking about uh, really difficult concepts or we really want them to learn vocabulary, having an image or a picture or letting them see a video really does help them. Uh, we also know taking them outside and letting them explore and having conversation outside helps them as well. So all of these intelligences, the idea is to try and get our curriculum to incorporate all of these multiple intelligences, at least once. It doesn't have to be every lesson all the time. And you don't have to cater to each student every single time. But we can introduce all of these inside our curriculum. So here are certain few um, underlying uh, beliefs in this, in, in this theory. So he said all of us have eight types of intelligences. Um, but as a teacher, and this is really, really, really important, what's really important is that 
our learning experiences do not have to re relate to our strengths. So for example, let's say um, that Bobby, and this isn't really Bobby, but <laughs> these are a group of my students, but um, let's say that he is very good with visuals and video. And then let's say over here that Katie, um, she's more kinesthetic. So you, as a teacher, it might be very difficult um, to be able to cater to all of their intelligences. But what Gardner says is actually we don't have to do that. That just by knowing what our strengths are, um, if we're strong kinesthetic learners, but maybe we're not such great visual learners, um, just or musical learners, just knowing our strengths can really help us with the way we study, with the way we learn, and just be conscious. And I believe that that's true because when I've taken different assessments to identify what are my strengths, then I was able to reflect and really look back and um, figure out, is this really what I'm good at? And, and, and some things I thought, yeah, I, I really am. So it's really great because what you can do is you can give your students different choices. Um, you can make your curriculum not so stagnant. In other words, it's not always from the textbook or it's not always a visual graph or it's not always a video we share or it's not always that they're um, memorizing or drilling, but that we have all of that combined in different types of lessons. And the great thing is that we can also become stronger in areas. So if your students do take notes or, um, for example, taking notes, there's ways to take notes and you can differentiate that. So if your students do have to take notes, for example, they're watching a video, some of your learners may do really well sketch noting because they're good at drawing and, and that's a way that they learn well. And then other students might be better at using an outline or graphic organizer. So that's what we talk about uh, when we talk about multiple intelligences. And giving your students the freedom to do an activity like that um, in the way that they they feel like testing it out and learning best. And the thing about Howard Gardner's theory is when he talks about learning styles, and this is different than multiple intelligences, he says that these are ways in which we approach our tasks or our learning. So we might, for example, note taking. Mine is going to look a lot different than Lakita's or Elena's or Julio's. All of our notes, if we put them together, everyone in this room, then our notes will probably all be very different. And that's part of our learning style. Now, when we understand more about the way we learn, it's really important our students understand this and know this and really reflect on it. Then they can make better choices or they can, they can see why they might struggle doing certain tasks and they can approach it differently. So learning styles isn't trying to get you stuck. It's not trying to get the teacher to say, okay, you have to teach like this. It has to be hands-on because you have this many kinesthetic learners. No, what it's trying to do is give you options for when your students struggle, then you can look at um, what their intelligences are and then you can come together and you can reflect on a better way to approach that topic or that subject. There are other theories that also talk about learning styles. Um, I learned about this one in my master's class. I have a master's um, in curriculum instruction ESL. And one that I really uh, enjoyed, one theory, was the done and done learning style model. Um, you can find out more information at learningstyles.net. Now, they have assessment, and I'll show you the assessment, but it isn't free. I will share with you some free assessments for learning styles, but I really did want you to take a look at what they look at. So they ask the learner questions about the environment. Do you like to... Uh, do you feel like you study better with more light? Do you feel like you study better with less light? Do you feel like 
you um, do you prefer to study in the daytime, in the afternoon, in the morning? And so it asks deep reflective questions like that that really get you to think. So when I actually took um, their survey, their assessment to figure out the best way that I study, I never thought about this before. I, when I took this, I was so amazed at all the information because I never really considered, um, do I have to eat? Do I have to walk around? Do I have to be in daylight when I study? And it was really enlightening and did help me when I had to study for really difficult subjects like statistics. It, it made it less stressful for me. So. I do think that there's a deep value in getting your students to take these assessments and really reflect on the best way that they learn. And of course, that's going to change. That's going to change as they grow up, as um, their brain changes. And they may find that they um, still have some of that initial um, learning style, but they may um, they may progress and get stronger in another uh, approach as well. So the done and done model, um, what it does is it, it goes through the environmental domain, the emotional, it asks questions about the emotions, uh, about your emotion, your motivation, sociological, physiological. So it goes a little bit more in depth. It's not talking about intelligences, but it's, it's, it's asking questions about uh, many different aspects of us. So how do our students discover more about their intelligences and learning styles? And how do you as a teacher learn about this as well? Because part of learning styles is also your teaching style. So it's important that you understand what your intelligences are because uh, like someone said in the chat box that they have problems with kinesthetic learners. Well, it may be that that's not something you're comfortable teaching with. So it's good to understand this about us as well. I know it really helped me as a teacher um, to really see how I mold my lessons and my instructional style and why I choose um, particular methods or why I gravitate to particular resources or materials. And it helped me to get out of my box and try testing different um, different areas that I hadn't before. So um, there are some free assessments. Uh, the one that I really liked a lot and where I've gotten a lot of my research was actually from a research article in Edutopia. Now I studied some other ones as well, even uh, from the, the official Howard Gardner uh, Resource Center. But I really liked with Edutopia, um, the the research there had to say. And they came with this free multiple intelligences assessment. So your students can actually take this online um, or you can print it out and then they can bubble it in. And then at the end, you can, um, you, you can reflect on it. And then your students can uh, pair up and they can ask each other, like figure out who in the classroom uh, matches with them or is, is, is really strong in areas that they're strong in. And then you can come up with ideas and plans on how you can help the ones who are stronger in other areas can really help each other um, grow in those areas as well. And this is really useful for group work as well because when you're pairing students or you're, uh, you do group work, you may want to pair someone um, with different in strengths um, so that way they can complement each other and they can see how they work together. There is also one at literacynet.org. Um, literacynet.org has a lot of information on learning styles as well and multiple intelligences. So you can uh, actually find what are your strengths by taking their online survey as well. So both of those are free options. And then of course you have the done and done one. That is not a free option, but this gives you an idea of their assessment and the kind of report that comes out. It's a very in-depth report. So what can we do when we have that information? 
Well, one of the ways um, that this theory really helps us is it helps us to make changes. And that's really important. So when you think about your learning environment right now, is it supporting different learning styles? Um, does it it, does it make room for students to be able to have freedom or do they all have to learn the same? Do they all have to, is it only modeled for one particular type of learner? And that's really important to ask ourselves and then make changes. With this particular classroom, you can see a couple of things. You can see where the learners, some are sitting down, some are listening, the music, uh, we have that music intelligence, um, as some over here, are writing and working by themselves. So you can see that this is a classroom and the teacher has made it to where the children um, can have that time. Now that doesn't have to be all the time. This could be five, 10 minutes within the class period where you let students learn um, in a way they feel like that day, okay? So some might wanna listen or some might wanna throw a puppet show because there's like a little puppet show thing here too. <laughs> you can take some of the lessons outside because some are naturalistic, okay? And students need a break. They like to go outside. We actually have a whole webinar on ways, activities, math, science, history, language learning, how you can do that outside. Um, and that's in a previous webinar that you can find on the American TESOL um, channel YouTube channel another way is that you you can another way to support this is have a project or problem-based learning if your students have a project then it's much easier for them to be able to 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 be able to add their own learning flavor to it so we say <laughs> um, and also if you grade with rubrics it's a little bit easier um, when you're when you're when you're assessing uh, these different types of projects uh, and having f some freedom within it so not just having everything planned and having where it has to be specifically like this or specific so there should be some criteria but there should be some room to be creative uh, for your students to make their own choices and to be able to also um, show you the way that they learn, okay? Um, and so it's good to give them choices. How do you give them choices when it's project-based or problem-based learning? Well, my students actually taught me this. Uh, one way is you can have them present the information in different ways. So m some of my students, when I tried to get them to do a PowerPoint. Now, this was a long time ago in 2000. <laughs> so that's how I, I say PowerPoint or a poster. Some of them wanted to do posters. Some asked me if they could do a Windows Media video. Uh, some asked me if they could give um, a PowerPoint. Some asked if they could do like acting something. And I went ahead and said, sure, why not? And it was fantastic. We had a great time. Um, and, and I was able to use a rubric and just made sure that the information that they needed to have was in there. So, for example, did they, how did they work as a group together? Um, did they present the information um, succinctly? Um, did they, did they uh, cover the points they were supposed to? So, for example, if they had a project where they were researching jobs, they had to research different jobs and careers did they did they present the salary information did they present uh, what the education was so they can do that in different ways so as long as they had um, that within it then not, it didn't really matter if it was in a video and an ebook you know the way they presented it it was um, really great another way that teachers really can um, help their students shine and be individual, be individuals is uh, by letting them have um, genius hour, it's sometimes called uh, passion projects or 20% time. And what that means is that you give a certain amount of time each week, you decide 
Um, it could be even a day. It could be every Friday. And your students dedicate that to exploring their own interests in a project they present later. You can give them mentors to be able to. So some students might, for example, want to research um, how to make a great skateboard. Others may want to code. They may want to create a program. Other students may want to give a presentation um, where they do a speaking presentation and they, they do an entire speech. So you give them the freedom to do that. And there are a lot of teachers who, it, who actually have a lot of great information about Genius Hour. And there are also different web tools. So one of the ways to also make this a little bit easier on you to really get students to um, work with their different intelligences is to have web tools, materials, apps, your resources make a lot of difference. So for example, when we have our students read a book, there's a lot of choices we can make with the book. Like, let's say they're studying Shakespeare. We could show them a video clip because there's plenty of Shakespeare videos on, on video. We could have them see comics or graphic novels because they have that uh, with Shakespeare. We can have them read the actual Shakespeare text. I mean, so there's different ways depending on the material you choose. Now, if you have different options of that material, then that can be very helpful as well. With the different web tools and apps, if you get, and these are all going to be free, but the ones that you choose are the ones that I'm showing you today. Um, you may have heard of some, and hopefully I'm introducing you to some new ones, but what they all have in common is they allow students to do multiple things, okay? And so we'll talk about that. One of the newest ones that is out is Sway.com. So with Sway, you can create a report, a presentation, a newsletter, or personal story. Um, a Sway you sign up for, it's from Microsoft. And it's great because in um, a Sway, you have lots of options too. It's a very interesting presentation. Um, and your students get a lot of choices, so they can have a lot of visuals, they can have effects, I think they can even have, um, they can integrate video, like YouTube videos in there as well. So there's a lot that you can do with Sway. They can add even the audio component if they are um, have that musical intelligence. Um, your students can always draw and then add that to the presentation as well. And, and with drawing, that could be kinesthetic as well because um, you know the, the, if they're good drawers as well, that'll be really, so there's lots and lots of options when it comes to Sway. And it's free, and a lot of teachers love Sway. Another one that I recently saw was Flovella. Um, I actually saw a teacher present with Flovella and it was just a beautiful, wonderful presentation. It's free. You can go to flovella.com. And Flovella combines words, images, video, sounds, gallery. So it has all these options for your students to be able to display the learning um, and use their different intelligence as well. Edubuncy. I really like Edubuncy. You can see here, it gives you different media types. You can have images that you upload, and once again, it could be drawings. They can actually draw within Buncee, which is what I really love. They can add a video, so some of them might want to work with video. Some of them may be really great at acting. So a lot of times when I work with students, um, I have them do group and pair work. And the reason why is because Sometimes I find that some students want to be in front of the camera and other students want to be the technical person. They want to be the one that films and is, is uh, able to film different scenes and plan it. And then other students want to be the ones that edit things or they want to make sure that everything is organized. 
So when you think about doing a group project and you use one of these web tools that is free, Edubuncy is also an app and the app is amazing. The students can actually record themselves on the app, so that's really cool. Of course, that's the iPad app, but they do have um, a regular uh, mobile phone app as well. Um, they even let you put in QR codes, they can scan, they have SoundCloud. I mean, so there's many, many, many different um, options. They can even add animations as well. Book Creator Lite, and Book Creator Lite is also really good for supporting various learning needs. They have closed captioning, um, they have different, um, they have ways that you can add video, pictures, drawings. Um, to publish, I believe you may have to pay, but if it is available in, um, in iOS and Android, um, and it's free to create the book. So you, your students can have the book, they can create it, they can look at each other's books. They just may not be able to publish it online for free. LittleBirdTales.com, it has an art pad so they can draw, um, they can add their voice, they can add text, and it's an ebook. It's a book too, and it just it, you can publish it online for free. Um, I believe it has an app, but it's $2.99 for the app. They even have a lesson plan database. So if you can't, if you see these tools and you think, wow, I'd really like to use that tool, but I don't have an idea for a project. These most of these tools have free lesson plans within the site. Um, I know Edu Buncy has. You can even copy their Buncy, so it's great. Tundu.com. Tundu. You can make a comic. Your students can make a book. They can doodle, and they can also make a character. And I believe they can make a video as well. So it has different options for your learners and that's free as well for mind mapping i really like poplet.com um, if you have the app you're able to draw within the app students can draw or they can just take a picture a lot of times um, if we're studying a particular topic i'll have my students go and take a picture and add it because if you do the web version then you can have your students um, each, all of them can contribute to the same poplet, which is really cool. They can also add video, they can also add images, and it will allow you to search. If you use the web version, you can search all within poplet. You don't have to go outside of poplet. Um, you can add links too, as well. So, and then of course, always, recommend Padlet and Linuit and one of the reasons why is because you can add you have a sticky uh, wall a sticky web page basically you can add sticky notes your students they can come and they can add different information it could be um, audio video um, and it's really easy this is one of the easiest tools it's supported on multiple devices on Android on a uh, Kindle on um, on a Chromebook, on a laptop, um, it, as long as you have the internet, then you can access these. The reason I have Linuit is because it's color coded. So if you want the notes, for example, if you have questions and answers, then it's a little bit easier to organize when they're color coded. Okay, but you can see there's some videos there. And so your students can add video as well. Um, it even has like maps, um, templates, it has calendar templates. And I know VoiceThread, many of you might be familiar with, but I definitely think it's good um, for students because it offers many choices. So your students can add a video comment, they can doodle, see, they can actually draw and doodle. They can add an audio comment, um, and you can have multiple students uh, contribute under one voice thread so that's that's very nice in the middle you can add a picture to show the topic you can see here where I've actually just put questions there I've, I've put vocabulary and questions for the students the students have used this for digital storytelling as well so they could all tell a story I've seen uh, where people 
uh, where teachers have their students create poetry, they upload it, and then it becomes a class. Each class, um, each student reads their poem with the picture they've added. So that's very nice as well. So though, that's the information. I hope you learned a lot. And even if you don't agree that there are only eight intelligences, and many people believe there are much more than that, um, the great uh, the great thing about Howard Gardner's theory is look at all the possibilities it has opened us to. And what it, I think is really important is that it's gotten our students to realize that they have learning strengths, that they're really good at something, whether it be um, playing, you know, hands on or musical or visual, uh, whatever, or naturalistic. Whatever their intelligence is, they realize they have a strength. And I think that that's really um, important for students to realize. So thank you so much for coming. And we will see you next week.